One of the first things you notice as you try to quiet the mind is the lack of quiet, all the chattering that's going on, all the discussions, the dialogues and committee discussions going on up in your head. It seems to be never-ending chatter. And our first thought as we start to meditate is, how can I stop the chatter? How can we just quiet all those voices so things can be perfectly quiet inside? And what you begin to realize as you practice is that you just can't put a stop to things that way. It's a more gradual process. So learning to bring that conversation under control. You start out with a lot of unskillful voices in there. And many times the, the discussion is not being run according to Robert's rules of order. This voice comes barging in, that voice, voice yells at you, this voice yells at you, this voice whispers in your ear. And all the subterfuge and techniques of, say, of a political meeting are nothing compared to what goes on in your mind. All the tricks the mind plays on itself with the, the different voices, how they try to get their way. Because many of them are not just voices to say things, but they have a purpose in saying their thing. There's a, an urging on to action in one direction or another. So they try all kinds of ways. The mind has all kinds of ways of getting a particular idea or a particular motion through the committee. And the way we work with the mind is to learn how to make that discussion more skillful to begin with. As you begin to meditate, you find that you begin to look, gain a little bit of detachment from the voices because you're beginning to watch them and not just think that they're speaking or you're speaking along with them. This is a lot, a lot of what the Buddha has to teach on the, the whole teaching of not self. It's not you talking in there. There are voices in there, and you tend to identify with them. But you can begin to disidentify with them as well. Say, well, whatever happens in my mind, I'm not necessarily responsible for things that come bursting into the mind. I don't have to act on them. And sometimes you say, I don't even have to get involved. If the voice comes and urges action, you can just kind of let it urge, 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 and then it'll stop after a while. You can begin to watch. And just the act of wanting to make that conversation more skillful, that in and of itself begins to distance you from it. And then we practice concentrating on the breath as a way of giving you a good, firm basis to stay outside of the discussion. But the discussion isn't going to go away on its own. You've got first, as I said, you have to learn how to make it more skillful. That mean, sometimes that means introducing new voices as well. Like in the case of the meditating, the voice that says, hey, stay with the breath, stay with the breath, make the breath comfortable, allow the breath to be comfortable. This is also related to the reason why the Buddha didn't encourage his monks to take vows of silence. There's a story in the text of a group of monks who spent the entire rains retreat. They made a vow, okay, we're not going to talk to each other. Each person just maintained silence throughout the, the rains. And at the end of the retreat, they went to see the Buddha. I'm very proud of the fact that they had succeeded in not talking to each other for the entire three months. It was common. He didn't praise them. He said, you've been living like sheep, like dumb animals. The mind doesn't become more skillful. This inner conversation doesn't become more skillful just by stopping your talking. First thing to learn how to do is if you live together, learn how to talk to each other in skillful ways, which may mean talking less than you might normally do. But it also means that when something is necessary, something has to be said, you figure out the best way to say it, the best time, the best place, the best words to couch your comments. And as you get more skillful with the use of your mouth, it forces the mind to get more skillful in the way it thinks. And you begin to notice the, the effects of your words. 
Now, when is the best time? Say, if there's something negative you have to talk about, okay, when's the best time to bring it up? What's the best way to say it? What's the most effective way of saying it? What way of saying it does the least damage to the group? And as you get more skilled in using your mouth this way, you, you begin to find that the conversation in your mind begins to change as well. Then on top of that, we have the tapes you can listen to and the books you can read to introduce new voices into the, into the conversation, better voices. It's also why we have the chanting. Some of the phrases of the chanting you find keep coming back into your head at odd hours of the day. And they're designed to be skillful additions to that conversation. Because as you're trying to pull out of the conversation, there are some conversations that are easier to pull out of than others. And conversations in the mind that are filled with recriminations and negative thoughts and harmful thoughts, those are hard to extract yourself from. But the conversations in your mind dealing with issues of true happiness, issues of being skillful, issues of reflecting on what's really important in life, those are a lot easier to pull out of because they tend towards quietude, they tend towards concentration. So as we're training the mind, it's not just an issue of stopping the thinking. It's learning how to think more skillfully. And that starts with learning how to use your mouth more skillfully. I mentioned this morning that John Lee Wench said you should bow down to your mouth every day. After all, you do have a human mouth. And the human mouth has a lot of power. It's not like the mouths of dogs and cats, a very limited vocabulary. We can say all kinds of things, and it has an enormous effect on our lives. You start paying attention to what you say in the course of the day and try to make it more skillful, you begin to realize, you begin to see that it does have an effect on how you relate to other people, how other people relate to you. The whole context of your life is really strongly affected by your speech. And as you work on that, the qualities of of working on your speech come into the, the issues of working on your own mind. The care you use in framing what you say. The thought and circumspection you use as you notice when is the right time to say it. What's worth saying, what's not worth saying. It develops mindfulness, it develops alertness. All good qualities you need in the meditation. At the same time, as you've got these better voices in your own head, it's a lot easier to pull out of them and watch them. So you can see, well, when a thought forms, how does it form? Beneficial thoughts are a lot easier to take apart in this way. Thoughts that are filled with self-recrimination, regret, these are very hard to take apart because it's so easy to get caught up in their stories. But more skillful thinking, it's easier to take apart. You begin to just watch the thought because it doesn't seem to have any any poison for the mind. And so it's easier to watch it come, watch it go. And then as you work with the meditation and you find you get quicker and quicker in seeing how the thought forms. We talk about making progress in the meditation, and for a lot of this it's uh, the experiences, of very strong experiences, say rapture, oneness, light. And these things are not to be sneered at. They're important. They give a sense of lubrication, a sense of refreshment to the practice. But the real progress is measured in how quickly you notice what's going on in the mind. For example, when the mind begins to slip off, you, the faster you catch it, you can bring it back. Okay, that's a sign of progress. And as you get quicker and quicker, you begin to see the process of thought formation in and of itself, and exactly what in there is happening. When do you start participating in a thought? All too often we're aware of a thought only when it's fully formed, but how did it get formed that way? Did it just happen on its own, or was there some participation on your part? And as you watch it more and more carefully, you begin to see it. It's just 
it starts out as just kind of a little stirring, and it's hard to say whether it's a stirring in the body or it's a stirring in the mind. It's on that borderline between the two. And then there's the act of getting interested, paying attention to it, trying to, and the question, what is this thought about? And then the mind was, oh, this is a thought about X, and this is a thought about Y. And then it turns into a full-fledged thought. Well, that act of labeling it, the act of interpretation. Can you watch the stirring that would normally lead to a thought and then not participate in that labeling, not participate in that trying to figure it out? And you see these stirrings that come, and if you don't participate in them, they go. They'll come again, and if you don't participate, they'll go. And you begin to see how much of this thought formation is really an intentional process on your part. The desire to figure out a thought, the desire to get into the thought. And why is, what, what's the basis of that desire? Is it boredom? Are you tired of being just sort of being very still? You want some entertainment? It's dangerous, you know. Some of those thoughts, once they get formed, they take over the mind and they may not be very entertaining at all. So you try to get quicker and quicker and seeing these, these voices as they form, where they're coming from, exactly how much you're putting into them right now, how much of it is just the result of past karma sort of bubbling up in the mind. And you find that you do get more and more control of that conversation. So that when, okay, when it's, you need to talk about things to yourself, okay, there it is. When you don't need to, you can keep things quiet. And the only conversation that goes on at that time is the, the part of the mind that's in control of the concentration, saying, stay here, stay here. Spread the awareness here. That's the skillful conversation you want to have more and more in charge. And once the concentration gets really solid, then you can start turning on those voices, the, the control center for your concentration. But don't be in too great a hurry to do that. You want the concentration really solid in order to take those voices apart. So the training of the mind is not just sort of stamping out all the mental chatter in the mind. It's learning how to make it more skillful, starting from the outside, being more skillful in what you say. This is why right speech is such an important part of the practice. Because where does speech come from? The Buddha says it comes from directed thought and evaluation, which will turn out to be factors in your concentration. You direct your thought to the breath, you evaluate the breath. But to get it to a point where you can really be effective in directing it to the breath and evaluating the breath, you have to be more effect you have to be more skillful in just the way you speak. The way you use those powers to create words. Words to other people and the conversation in your own mind. Then when that conversation gets more skillful, okay, then you can start taking it apart. Even more refined ways. It's finally when you sort of break through, who, who is this that's talking here? That's when things really open up in the mind. Of course, we all want to jump to that spot, but to get there it takes, takes skill, takes time, takes perseverance. But that's the way it is with any good thing in life. The things that are of lasting value are the ones that take time to master. So we've got an hour right now. Do what you can within the hour. To a very, at the very least, bring some control into this committee con conversation that's going on. So make it, make it easier and easier for it to settle down, because once you can settle down, then you can see the con conversation even more clearly. That's why the Buddha said that concentration and discernment have to go together. You can't do just insight practice or just concentration practice. The two of them go hand in hand. And it's right here at this issue, there's these mental voices. 
and how skillful you are in relating to them. That's, that's where the real meat of the practice lies.